All right, so this time I have started recording already. Yes, so I won't forget. Fortunately, last time I was just, you know, kind of talking about a lot of things that are not directly relate, related to the class, so we didn't lose out a whole lot of actual content. All right. So let's put this one into view. There we go. And all right, so I am debating whether to work on the exam on the tablet or whether to work on it just you know, using a notepad. I can do it either way. And why is this not make let him okay there we go. So this is not my tablet. This is just a reader. Um, and as I said, I haven't quite decided yet which way to go. But so I guess we'll, you know, we'll, we'll make a decision when we get to that point. <clears throat> so this is exam two from last semester. The recorder is up and running. So I just want to make sure that is the case. Um, the usual stuff is here. You know, the exam is individual. No collaboration is allowed during the exam, blah, blah, blah. Paper-based content you know, that is prepared prior to the exam can be used as long as there's no interaction. Do not share or discuss any part of the exam in class or otherwise until the next class meeting, you know, because some people may be sick on that day or for whatever reason cannot take the exam on that day. Um, sufficient explanation means your answer has to connect definitions that we talk about in class to the answer, and then you have to logically make connections between the steps, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, then we can move on to the first question. So the first question is a, a PDNC kind of question, um, and the circuit is usually something that you may or may not have seen. Okay, so I'm not testing whether you can regurgitate <clears throat> from the lab. I'm trying to test whether you can reapply the techniques that you have learned from the labs. So what you need to focus on are the techniques, not so much, um, you know, exactly, okay, I'm just going to dry practice the same circuit over and over again. That is not, that may not be very helpful. Okay, so in this case, you know, we do have a few, you know, steps. So the first step is, you know, B and G, you know, whatever they are, I'll show you, are both zeros, and then one transitions to a one, then the other one also transitions to a one, and then finally, this one, you know, transitions from a one back to a zero. So that's kind of how the uh, question is set up. Uh, the rest of this is really just talking about um, how to track things, you know, things that you should probably know already by this point. Um, but since you already have this exam since about a week ago, you know, so I am assuming that all of you have read the exams a little bit at least, and hopefully you have tried out how to answer these questions already, because that's actually going to be helpful in terms of, um, you know, understanding my explanations today. So what we'll do is we are going to take a look at the table. So this is not really the best format, you know, because, you know, I think it, it's hard for me to fill in these things, you know, using um, the PDF reader. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to bring this, you know, on my laptop, on my tablet, and then I'll use the tablet to fill in these particular columns. So give me a second here to prepare for that. Okay. There we go, and now I should be able to connect to the Wi-Fi. <clears throat> How many people got a chance to read the questions and try to answer those questions before today? Okay, this is fine. Okay, you know, just I I gave it a try. You know, you know that's fine. You know, it's better than not reading the you know, the exam at all. Okay, so giving it a try is good. All right, so a few more steps and we are good to go. Okay. All 
Yeah, the software on this tablet is also not very stable. So we'll see whether it makes a connection or not. Nope. All right. <clears throat> so if it doesn't make a connection, you know, typically I need to reboot you know, the tablet. So this might take a minute or two. So let me go do a restart. restart. It doesn't take that much time. My hobby is, you know, bring a lot of different kind of devices, you know, to my, you know, kind of daily routine. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, um, there are a lot of devices where the hardware, the electronics is done perfectly, but the software is not. And that just kills the product. <clears throat> that kind of emphasizes the importance of your know, software development. All right, so I'm hooking up to the Wi-Fi again. Okay, that's all good. And we share the screen and see whether this can see it or not. Nope. Oh. Okay. Hmm. Yep, ten, ten, zero, one, eighty, eighty. Well, maybe it's on the PC side. All right, so let's give this one more try. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to use the other one. All right. Here. Hmm. That is weird. It just doesn't work here you know, sometimes. Um, I guess today is one of those days that it, it refuses to work. All right. <clears throat> well, we're, we're going to use the traditional way, which is you know, getting into this table. Um, I want to see if I can copy and paste this table. So copy and open up a spreadsheet. And I can put that spreadsheet to where you guys can see it too. Give me a second to navigate there. So if you have your own computer with you, or even on a cell phone, uh, this one is visible to you now. If today is 2024-0409. <clears throat> you should be able to see it now, and I'm try trying to paste. Nope, it didn't grab the content. Ugh. Okay, so. Hmm. I just need this portion. Okay, control C. Control V. Nope. <laughs> Doesn't like it. All right. We're gonna, I'm going to have to do it the, the old fashioned way, which is just doing it by hand. All right. All right. So, the way to read this table here, if you do not remember doing this you know, before, is the top digit here is the node number, is a node identifier. The, um, this is the name of the component, and these are the ports of that component. So as I make copy you know, from one place to another place, I will explain all of that stuff. So that means you know, we have 
a component called J, which is an SR latch. And an SR latch has four ports. It has S, R, Q, and NQ as ports. Each port connects to a, uh, to a node, and the nodes are just numbered, you know, two, zero, five, and four. Those are just IDs, okay? So there are no particular reason why it is called component J. There are no particular reason why the first node is two. It is just an identifier. Yes? Yes, I am recording. <clears throat> All right, so that's for one single component. So I'm just gonna minimize this, you know, make sure that I have room for the other components. Obviously, in your exam, this is gonna be a little bit easier because you can just write here, okay? But I cannot connect to my tablet today, so I have to do it the long way. So the next component is called F. It is also an SR latch. So I'm just gonna make a copy here. So in this case, the nodes is node four, node one. This one does not connect to a node. In other words, it is a port that does not connect to anything else. That's why it's a blank. And then the component is F. And then here we have the ports S, R, Q, and N, Q. So these four, okay, let me move this one a little bit to the side. So now these four are representing one particular component and how the pins are connected to um, the ports of the other components. So are we doing okay so far in terms of understanding, you know, what the table or what the header of the table is trying to tell you? Are we good? Does everybody remember what a node is? Okay, all right, good. So a node, name of the component, and ports of the component. So when we talk about SR latch, we are talking about the SR latch that we have talked about in this class because there are two different types of SR latches. One type of SR latch, the one that we talk about in this class, uses a NAND gate as a component. There's also a SR latch that makes use of a NOR as a component. The two SR latches are equivalent in terms of what they can do, but they perform it differently. So the behavior is different, even though they can actually both get the job done. So when I refer to an SR latch, I'm referring to the SR latch of this class, the one that we have talked about. So I just wanted to make that clear, you know, because you know, sometimes you know, people uh, use some external you know, resources and then they go like, oh, okay, how come this SR latch does not do the same thing as the SR latch that I study? All right, so the next component is component D. It is also an SR latch, so we have three SR latches in this particular design. So component D connects to, okay, so component D has four ports. Once again, because it is an SR latch, these are the four ports that it also has, just like the other two SR latches. And then the nodes is three, five, six, and empty. So this empty, once again, means this particular port, which is port NQ of component D, is not connected to anything else. It's just an output port, that's just like, okay, I'm outputting something, but nobody seems to care about what I'm outputting. So that's what a blank is. So the, the blank should never lead to um, any further tracking because you know, it's output nobody cares about. All right, so we only got a few more. Um, component A is a, I think it's a NAND gate, I cannot remember, you know, so we have to read that a, you know, in just a little bit. So. Is a what? Is an OR gate? Okay. So it is. it has two inputs, in zero, in one, and has one output. And then the, port, the node numbers that each port connect to is three, one, and two. So that's the component A. And then we just have a few more ports to specify. Those are input ports and output ports. And we have B, H, and G. So we have B, H, oops, okay, wrong row, never mind. B, H, and G. So these co correspond to, these are just ports. Two of these are input ports, one of these are is an output port. It will be clear which one is which one. 
because you know in the text earlier, it describes you know how we change the input point pins, and then the only remaining one is the output point. So once again, shrink these a little bit so it you know doesn't take up as much space, and then the last part is just you know uh, it's a space for you to write down is it an NC versus a um, PD phase. So that's you know that's the column where we can say PD ND PD ND and so on, PD NC sorry PD NC PD NC and so on. All right, so now I can sort of talk this away, but before I do, you know I'm just gonna double check and make sure that <clears throat> I got the ports right. So this part talks about you know, what each component is. So F is a SR latch, A is an OR gate, just like what you said. Um, J is a SR latch, D is a SR latch, B and G are input pins, and then H is an output pin. So that's how we read this portion here. The only one that is not clear what it is is the um, is the gate. Okay, A as a gate is an OR gate, but if you just read the table, it is not clear that it is an OR gate because it easily could have been a NAND gate, can be an AND gate, and so on. Um, but the SR latches are pretty clear because only SR latches have those you know, four specific ports. S, R are inputs, N and NQ. I mean, Q and NQ are output ports of an SR latch. All right. So now we are ready to you know, deal with this. And the first thing we need to do is to make sure that B and G are both starting with zeros. So that's the first thing we need to do is look at B and G and they are going to start with zeros, and always start with an NC. In other words, we want to understand the connectivity of the input pins and understand where they go based on node connectivity, which translates to actual conductors on a circuit board, okay? All right, so to track that down, you have to be, you, you just have to track the numbers. In other words, this one connects to node zero, so everything on node zero would update to a zero, okay? So now we just kind of look it up here. This is another node zero. So this, as an input pin and as an input port, is going to, be, is going to change to a zero. And now we look at node one. Node one is also being changed to a zero because you know, G is an input pin. So when we change that input pin, everything connected to node one would also change to a zero. So we have this one here, okay? It is going to be a zero. And we have one more here that should also change to a zero. Is that okay? So in your lab, remember the PD NC lab? So in that particular lab, the spreadsheet uses used color coding because most of us you know, can differentiate between you know, those colors, like five or so is okay. In the exam, okay, the reason why I switch from color coding to actual numerical value is not because I don't have a color laser printer. I do have a color laser printer. But to differentiate up to seven different colors is not possible. It's not feasible for most people. Even if you're not colorblind, it is still difficult to differentiate between some of the colors, and that's why I do not want to use color coding in the exam. Numbers, everybody can read a number and go like, okay, I just have to locate all the columns with a zero. I have to locate all the columns with a one. So you know, it makes it kind of easier that way. Question? Yep. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Nope. We, we had the same thing, you know, except you know, these are both phase. You know, basically, they are the origin. You know, these are the first two that got changed um, because these are input ports. But everything that the input ports are input pins are connected to, they would update on the first NC row. Yeah, that's in the lab too. Yep. So the next row is going to be a PD, you know, propagational delay. So do you guys remember how to? what to do on a PD row. What do you look for on the row right before the PD row, and what do you do when you do find stuff? Okay, so what, do, what are we looking for? How do we start 
to work on the role that is labeled PD. Component or gates, yes. Okay, very good. So we are looking for things where the input ports have changed. <clears throat> um, with SR latches, the S and R are the input ports. With the OR gate, IN1, IN0 are the input ports. So we are looking for those specific columns and ask, are we, looking, are we seeing some changes? So we are seeing a change here because before this, they're all question marks. So is that what you're referring to, you know, that we start off with all question marks? Okay, fine. We'll, we, we, we'll, we'll insert one additional row and just fill it up with question marks because you know, I think that's, that makes it a little bit more clear of why we see some changes. So we just have your know, question marks for the entire row here. Is that kind of what you're referring to? No. Uh, Avery. Yep. Okay. Cool. All right. So we can see, ah, this is a change. Okay. It went from unknown to known being zero. And this is the R pin of an SR latch because J is an SR latch. So does that give us a definite answer of at least one of its output ports? So now you have to remember what is an SR latch, okay? You know, if the R pin of an SR latch is a zero, does it guarantee any of its output to a known definite state? Okay, so how do you construct an SR latch? That's the next question. It's made out of two NAND gates, right? The output of one NAND gate, the top NAND gate, becomes Q. The bottom NAND gate becomes NQ. Do you guys still remember that? Yes? Um, the SR latches on the S here, it says we're using the NOR based one. The NOR based one? Yeah, that's what it says on the top. I, hmm, that would be very curious because. Okay. Oh, right, right. I also gave you guys the truth table. Thank you. That's a good catch. Okay, I did not read the instructions carefully. Okay, very good. So there's a truth table. There we go, thank you, okay. So I caught myself. <laughs> so this is the truth table. Okay, so I correct myself, you know, because I didn't read my own question carefully. So that means you, know, you really need to read the question carefully because since I did not, I almost made a mistake. So this is a or nor based your know, truth table you know, for the uh, SR latch. So now the question is, if I know the R input is a zero, does it guarantee the output to be specific things? So how do you look at this truth table and know the answer to that question? Should I repeat the question? Okay, so look at this truth table here. This is one row where R is a zero. This is the other row where R is a zero. If you look at the Q and the NQ of these two rows, do you see Q or NQ having a consistent state? Nope, neither, right? Because your Q is a zero in this case, but then it becomes NC, which is no change. Um, in this case, it is a one for NQ and, you know, here it is a no change either, which means you know, we preserve whatever state it used to be, we just do not change it. So it's not consistent. So that means you know, if we have a transition from a known to a zero for the R pin, then we don't know anything for sure for the output pins over here, which is okay. We just kind of go like, okay, fine, it's a dead end. This would be a dead end as well, okay, because you know, R, the R pin or of F, which is also a NOR based SR latch, is also, you know, um, the R pin becomes a zero, which means you know, we do not know what's going to happen to Q or NQ, so we cannot make a connection. We cannot make a conclusion. So what about this one over here? This is an OR gate, and we know one of the input pin is becoming a zero. Does that help me determine the output? Okay, this is a regular OR gate, okay? So 
to answer this question, it's the same approach, except I did not give you the truth table of OR. But do you know the truth table of OR? Okay. So if you look at the truth table of OR, I'm just going to air gesture this one. Zero or zero is a zero. And then all the other rows are ones, right? So that tells me right away that knowing one of the input pins is a zero does not give me a definite answer of what the output should be. Because it depends on what the other input pin is. If the other input pin is also a zero, zero or zero is a zero. But if the other pin is a one, then we have one or zero, which is a one. So that means just knowing in one is a zero cannot give me a definite answer of what the output pin should be. So that means this is it. Okay, you know, we're, we have no any we we have no deduction that we can do at this at this point. This entire PD row is empty. It is blank. Is that okay? So I'm going to pause here. Okay, to see if there are any questions of why we have a steady state right now at this point. There's no further propagation of changes because um, all of the devices that see an input change have basically there's no definite answer that I can provide of the output pins. Yes? Um, can you refer to the columns? Uh, column two and column three. Columns are vertical and then rows are horizontal. Column two and column F, or column two and column F, how are they zero? Or because they connect to the nodes. So this connects to node zero, and node zero connects to the pin that just got changed to zero. This one connects to node one, and node one connects to the port that just got changed to a zero. And same with this one, it connects to node one. Okay. Yeah, so basically row one, the entire row of row one, is telling you, you know, the connectivity between the ports. Which pin of which component connects to which pin of which other component. Mm -hmm, sure. So some of you may find it useful to draw the diagram first, okay? But personally, I don't think it's going to be helpful. <clears throat> personally, once I identify the components, I would much rather to work with just the table. But that's your choice. If you draw a diagram, you know, I'm not going to take any points off. But if you think that can help you in terms of tracking down you know, what's going to happen to the circuit, go ahead and draw the circuit. Um, it's just that, from my perspective, it's not really helpful because I can use you know, the first row to figure out you know, how things are connected and much rather depend on that than the diagram. All right, so with a PD done, you know, that means you know, this entire thing is done. So that means I can now move on to the next change of the input ports. So now we have an NC first, and then we go back to the question. And the second step, okay, so we are done with the first step. The second step is changing just G from a zero to a one. So we go back to here. This is G. It is now changed to a one. Now, this is still a node uh, connectivity phase because you know, once we change one of the input pins, everything connected to the input pin would also have to change. Now, this is connected to node one. Node one connects to two other things, this thing here, and also this thing over here. So those two columns will also need to be changed. That's what NC would do. So this is connected to here. This is a one over here. This also connects to here. And as a result, that becomes a one. Do we have any questions about this part? This is based on the electrical connection between the ports. And we're doing OK. All right, <clears throat> so now we move on to a PD, which is propagational delay, or after a propagational delay, what is changed in this circuit? So once again, we look at all the components. 
that has at least one of its input ports changed you know, because of the NC row that is right above. So in this case, we only have two places to look. We look at column F okay, and ask, is this corresponding to one of the input ports of a component? The answer is, yep. It is pin R of SR latch F. Okay? Now, I did change you know, our SR latch from the NAND-based one to the NOR-based one. So let's just say that I cannot remember the truth table because this is new to me. So what you do is you look up the truth table that is provided in the question itself, okay, which is at the beginning here. And then you ask, if the R pin is a one, does it guarantee the output to be a particular state? The answer this time is yes. Because when you look at this row, which has input pin R being a, a one, the output pin NQ is a zero. When you look at this one, it also guarantees NQ being a zero. But Q on the other hand is not guaranteed. Because in this case, even though R is a one, Q is a zero. In this case, even though R is one, Q is a one. So I cannot guarantee the state of Q, but I can guarantee the state of NQ being a zero. So that means I can now say for sure that column H is going to change from a unknown to a zero here. I'm gonna pause and see if there are any questions about this. In terms of components, the NOR-based SR latch is new. But that's okay because I gave you the entire truth table also, so you can rely on the truth table. In terms of the mechanism of how we track down the changes, it's the same as your lab. The PDNC lab did exactly the same thing, except it worked on a kind of smaller and simpler circuit. Are we still doing okay so far? Do we have any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then we move on to the other pin that also got changed. This also got changed because it used to be a zero, now it is a one, it is a transition, which means I have to look up and ask, hmm, this is in one of the component called A. A is a OR gate. If I know one pin of an OR gate is a one, does that guarantee a specific output for that particular gate? Okay, I see a lot of nods. What should it be? It should be a one, very good. So that means at this point I can guarantee now this is, that is a one. So that concludes the PD because you know, both components that got at least one of the input pins changed, I can now guarantee the output is changed. So after a PD that is non-empty, this is a PD row that is non-empty, that means I have to go through an NC next. Because you know, the output port of a component just got changed, which means electrically speaking, everything that connects to the output port that just got changed, all of those other things also need to be updated in the next NC row. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So now we look up you know, the, uh, we track one, we track down one at a time, we track down this one first. This is node three. So that means everything on node three should become a zero. So now we just have to be very careful to go through everything in node three. So this is the next one, okay? It should get a zero, but over here. <clears throat> uh, this is also node three, so it should also update to a zero. And I think those are all the node threes. This one on the other hand is on node two. So now we have to locate everything on node two and update all of those to once. So this is a node two and I'm just scanning. This is the only other node two. So that one also need to be changed. In this case, changed to a one because you know, this is a one. So this one has to be a one as well. So that would conclude the NC phase. And then the next one, if your NC phase is not empty and they should never be empty, that means the next one, the next row has to be PD because you know, it is going to change some of the input ports. The only question is, do those changes also you know, change the output port of the affected components? Yes? I had a one to go later on. Uh-huh. Oh, the, the ones that do not have a node output? If it, do, if it doesn't have a node output, you know, oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yep, so you might end up with an NC that is blank. Yep. 
<clears throat> All right, so now we go through a PD, which is the same step, which is looking at the previous row, which is this one. I'm going to highlight it so that you can you know, easily you know, see it. This is the other thing. Um, in the exam, you might find bringing a ruler to be helpful so that you can line things up a little bit more, you know, more easily, uh, both vertically and also horizontally. So I would bring a ruler you know, to help you kind of line things up a little bit. <clears throat> or on the other hand, if you think you can track down colors really well, better than the average person, you can bring your color pencil, okay, you know, and just kind of color all the columns the way you want it. All right, so now we have a PD, and this time we have J, we have component J. Okay, this is component J right here. We have the S pin being a one, R pin being a zero. Will that guarantee the output of the Q and the NQ in some way? Well, we'll take a look, right? You know, so because you know, I cannot remember. Okay, this is a NOR gate based you know, SR latch, which is not the same as the one that we look at. So this time we have S being a one, R being a zero. So we are looking at this specific row here. There's only one row of the truth table corresponding to the current state. So that means, yep, this is the only row we have to be concerned about. And the question is, does it guarantee specific states for the output ports, Q and NQ? Definitely, right? Q is guaranteed to be a zero, and Q is guaranteed to be a one. So that means you know, for the PD row this time, we have to now update you know, this to be a zero and this to be a one. In other words, we are applying what we have already learned in that lab, but to a component that is new to us you know, in this question. Yes? <clears throat> So the, when you see blank cells, it means it has not changed. So that means by the time we get to row 11, column B still has a value of zero. I'm sorry? <laughs> On the first step. You mean row two? after the steady state. So the steady state is on row six, <clears throat> but all the state from the previous step continues. In other words, you know, all of these states here, you keep, they keep going until they're changed, which is the same thing as what you did in the lab. So in that lab, you know, all the states of all the different ports continue, you know, on the different steps. The only thing that got changed between the steps or the input pins, or potentially up to one input pin. I seldom make changes to both at the same time. Usually I make a change to only one at a time. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so that takes care of your uh, component J. So now we move on to comp the other components that have at least one input changed. So the next one is going to be component D because S just got changed to a zero. So as far as component D is concerned, um, the S pin is now a zero, but the R pin is still an unknown. So that means we are looking at these two rows in the truth table, and these two rows in the truth table says, um, well, the output pins Q and NQ kind of depend on what R is. But since we don't know what R is, R is still unknown, so that means we still cannot make any definite conclusion of what the Q and the NQ pins you know, should be. So that means you know, we really cannot know anything about these two. You know, it's inconclusive. But wait, we are not done yet because we also have a zero here. This zero corresponds to in zero of component A, which is an OR gate. The OR gate already has one of the input pins of being a one. So that means eh, this is not gonna change the output. The output will continue to be a one. If the output continues to be a one, we do not write a one here because it's, it's just continuing with whatever it had before. So this is, there's no update 
on this particular cell either. Is that okay? Does everybody understand the rules of how we update the cells in this table? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, we'll see a lot of nods. Okay. <clears throat> And everything is being recorded right now, so we are good with today's lecture in terms of recording, unless you know, something happens terribly to my computer. All right, so that means you know, we are done here. But since we do have two updates over here, that means you know, the next phase is going to be another NC, because you know, these two output pins, they con one connects to node five, one connects to node four, so that means everything connected to node five need to become a zero. Everything that connects to node four, they need to be become a one this time on this N zero. So we're gonna locate the you know, five first. Okay, so locate five. Here's a five that needs to be updated to a zero. And there are no further fives you know, in terms of the node numbers. The next thing is to locate the fours. Everything that are connected to node four need to become a one. Here's a node four. So that needs to become a one. And there are no further node fours. So that should conclude this particular NC phase. And then we switch back to PD again. <clears throat> so now we look at you know, this particular thing one at a time, okay? So always process one at a time. So at this point for component F, we know that the S pin is a one. We also know the R pin is a one as well. So that means you both are ones. Do we know the output? Go ahead. They should be zero and zero. Very good. Yep. So Q should be a zero and NQ should be a zero for component F. So this is what we're going to conclude in the PD. And we basically update this to be a zero, like so. And this one, even though it is a zero, but it was a zero already, so it's not a change, and that's why we don't put anything here. Is that okay? Because that is important, because that depends, depending on whether, in this case, a PD row has updates, it will determine whether you need another NC or not. Because if a PD row is blank, then you are already at a steady state, which means there will be no further NC row, you are done with that particular step. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So we are done with that one. And what about this one over here? This is corresponding to R of component D. At this point, component D has both S and R being zeros. So when the S and R are both zeros, the outputs are NC, which means you know, no change. So that means you know, whatever these two are, which are unknown, they continue to be unknown. In other words, we do not update these two because they continue to be whatever they were before, which are unknowns. Is that okay? So can, does everybody know how I came up with all of these answers you know, to all these cells based on the truth table that is provided to you of a component that we haven't seen before? So we good? Okay, all right, excellent. <clears throat> So that means here yeah, we have another NC again. Okay, so here's another NC. So this is what you were talking about, you know, where the NC itself is blank. The reason why it's blank is because in the previous PD, it corresponds to a port that does not connect to anything else. There's no node ID corresponding to this you know, port, which means it doesn't connect to anything else. If it doesn't connect to anything else, it can change all it wants but it won't necessitate another NC because pff, NC only connects a component based on connectivity of the node. If it doesn't connect to a node, there's nothing to propagate. So this NC is now a blank, which means we are done with the second step. So we can now move on to the third step. The third step is changing B from a zero to a one. G is maintained, so we don't want to change G. So we just look up B and say, okay, this is now an NC, and B is now changed from a zero to a one. And I usually bold face the other one because it is corresponding to a step. 
I know you cannot really bold face you know, when you're handwriting, so you don't have to hand, you don't have to bold face it. But since I have the ability to bold face it, I just want to use the same standard as in your um, uh, in your lab earlier in the semester. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. So with an NC, we look at the input port V. It is at node zero. It connects to node zero. So we look up all of these things, and the only other thing that connects to node zero also need to be updated the same way. So, um, and this is why I said a ruler would be helpful, because a ruler will help you locate you know, exactly what cell to update. So this one will also update to a one, because it is also connected to node zero. And then we have a PD, okay, because after an NC, we always have a PD. And this is when I am going to use a particular spreadsheet feature so that I can maintain the first few rows in view while I scroll the rest a little bit, as little as I can. Okay, so I just have to scroll up once, but that's not easy because I think that's the quantum that I can scroll you know, because of the control. Okay, but you know, I think we still show enough to answer the question, because at this point, you know, component J, which sees one of its input pins being changed, now it has both input pins being ones. The question is, am I going to observe any change to the output? So looking up the truth table, which is provided in the question itself, we should see both Q and N Q being zero. So Q is already a zero at this point. There's nothing I need to write down, but NQ was a one before, it is now changed to a zero. So this is when we need to go to this particular cell and change it to a zero. Is that okay or not? Are we still doing okay? All right. And that's it, okay? This is it for this PD because this is a input pin and for an input pin, the only thing we have to do to it is to propagate it on the same NC row after that, you know, it's not going to make any changes. <clears throat> so after the PD, we have another NC. And this time we are looking up this particular cell, find out what node number it corresponds to, which is four. And then we update all of the other pins that connect to node four to a zero. This is the only one. Okay. So now we have to go to another PD. And then we say, well, is this going to change anything for, the, for that specific component? So now we are looking at component F. The S pin is now a zero. The question is, do we know, you know the definite states of Q or NQ at this point? And is, it, is that going to be a change? So we look up the truth table, zero, zero, okay, on these two rows. Uh, we don't know anything about the R pin, you know, even at this point, we don't know anything about the R pin. So that means we cannot make any conclusions. Huh? Oh, I, I need to scroll up a little bit, I guess. Scroll up. You're right. <laughs> the R pin is a one. So we have zero and one. So that means the output should be one and zero for Q and NQ. Thank you. Uh, so Q is guaranteed to be a one, which is a change from what it was before. So we have to write down a one over here. And this is remaining as a zero because it was a zero already on row nine. And you know, even though it is, it has a definite state of a zero, we don't change anything here, okay? Because you know, it is, it's not changed. Are we doing okay so far with all this? All right, so since you know, this PD row is not entirely empty, we have another NC, which is looking at the only change in this case and ask what it is going to change. And because it connects to no node, that means nothing else is gonna change as a result. So this NC is empty, the entire row is empty, which means we are now ending the third step of this question. And we are moving on to the last step of the, of the question. The last step is changing G from a one to a zero. So it does get a little bit difficult for me to show because you know, it's, 
I have to keep scrolling, so that means it's a little bit harder for me to track the latest change to each cell. So in this case, G is changed from a one back to a zero, and it is on node one, so everything on node one should become a zero. So this is on node one, it should become a zero, and this is also on node one, and it should also be changed to a zero. This is the origin of all the changes. I'm going to make it both face. Are we still doing okay? Yes? Okay. So I think at this point, there are two things you might be thinking about. One is, this is boring. Okay, because we're repeating, we are basically applying the same mechanism over and over again looking up the truth table, determining what is changed, and using the same rules to update the cells. So if that is what you're thinking, congratulations, you're getting it, okay? On the other hand, if you're having some difficulty understanding what we are doing, then I would suggest you to redo the lab for the NCPD lab, and then also possibly to rewatch this part of the video of today's lecture so that you kind of pause all the steps and then think about what are we doing, why are we doing this, how does this relate to the lab that we have done already. Okay, so moving on. So at this point we know for this component F, both inputs are zeros, and if both inputs are zeros, you know, the outputs do not change, so we know component F is not going to give us anything for the next PD, because it is just maintaining the states for the output pins. And then this zero may be useful. It all depends on what is in zero, okay? Because this zero corresponds to in one, which means for the OR gate, one side is a zero. So we kind of need to look up what is in zero at this point. And in zero, last time you know, we changed it, it was a zero. So that means it is still a zero at this point. So zero or zero is a zero which means you know, I need to think about whether to put a zero here, because if it is already zero, I don't want to put a zero here, but if, if it was a one or a question mark before, then I need to update it to a zero. So I have to scroll a little bit. It was a one, so that means you know, we are updating it to a zero, so that's why we have to put a zero here. This is where the paper version is gonna be easier, because you just look up the row, look up the column, and go like, oh, okay, you know, we have a change, but in here, I have to scroll up and down, so it makes it a little bit harder to follow. All right, so now we go like, okay, since the PD updates at least one thing, we have to go for another NC. This one corresponds to node two, so all the node twos will have to change to a zero. So you just scan, and this is the only other node two, or the only other pin that connects to node two, so we're gonna put a zero over here. And then we go for another PD because you know, we have just changed the state of at least one input. So J, <clears throat> component J, now has S being zero, R being one, and then we look up the truth table and ask, okay, do we know the output pins for sure? So zero, one as input means the output will be one and zero. We got this zero already. The only question is for column C, was it also a one. Nope, it was a zero, so that means we have to update that one from a um, zero to a one. Okay, let me just look up again. Yep, it was a zero, now it is a one, so it is a change, so we have to track it, <clears throat> which means you know, we have another NC. The NC is looking at this thing, which is connected to node five, and we update all the node five 201. Here's another node 5. This is the only other node 5 here pin. So we go here and then we change it to a 1. And then we have another PD. So as far as component D is concerned, we know R is now a 1. It is just changed. But now we need to know what S is in order to look up the truth table. So we have to look up a little bit. It was a 0. So that means you know, we have we're looking at the same row over here. We are now guaranteeing Q is a one and Q is a zero. So now we have to look for you know, whether they, they had you know, any states from before. Nope, they were both unknown. 
So for component D, both Q and NQ had remained unknown all the way up to this point. So that means up to this point, at this point, we have to update both of them in order to have to guarantee that Q is a one and NQ is a zero. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay, so this is really, really mechanical. From a certain perspective, you kind of have to keep track of all the details, you know, the entire time. And then, you know, we have another NC because we just changed, you know, two pins. <clears throat> so this one corresponds to node six. There's only one other pin that connects to node six, which is this one. So we change that one to also a one. And then this zero has no node connecting, node connectivity. So it's like, okay, you know, there's nothing we have to change in an NC. So this particular NC, you know, technically speaking, you have to go for another PD, but there's nothing you have to do here because H as a component is an output pin. This is the only output pin of the entire circuit. Um, when you change an output pin, whatever outside of this circuit that connects to the output pin, they're gonna have to do something. But for this component, we are done, okay? Because the output pin does not change anything else in the circuit that we are analyzing. So we are done with this particular step as well. And this, since this is the very last step of the entire thing, we're done with question number one. Do we have any questions about question number one? Yeah, go ahead. I cannot remember. <laughs> I can look it up. Um, the class still has about 50 people, so that means I'm gonna take the fifth highest score and turn it into the new 100%. Um, so that is that is still in effect for this class. Well, that's because I'm explaining all the steps. You should know how to do it too, because we did the lab. Like, the lab is the same thing. Like, you haven't had the practice, yes. Yeah, we haven't had the most But I don't remember anything from prior semesters. <laughs> but now you have the second chance to do this. But this is mechanical, okay? Once you understand the mechanics of doing this, it is applying the same steps over and over again. So that means, you know, if you understand what the table is about, what is PD, what is NC, and how to read the truth table, you are just applying the same steps over and over again. That's all I can say. Because I'm doing the same steps as you guys would have been doing too. You know, because I, I have to look up the truth table. I cannot remember the truth table of a NOR based you know, SR latch. So the, the entire time you know, I was reading off, reading off of that table. Yep. Yeah, you can just add a PD that's blank. Mm -hmm. All right, so any other questions? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. including the lab time. <clears throat> the only issue with that is for people who are taking the test at the DSPS you know, center, because you know, some people you know, uh, are taking the test with some additional time. So if I make this class you know, having like three hours to work on this, that means you know, the uh, people with 50% accommodation will have 4.5 hours, which I don't have a problem with, but they have to schedule you know, with the DSPS center to have 4.5 hours as a stretch of time. So um, the test really is designed, you know, at least in my mind, 
to be finished in one hour and a half. Well, this question took, took uh, one hour. Well, that's because I'm explaining. If, if, if you want me to do this without explaining, I can do that, and then we can use that as a reference. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you want to go there, because you know, that's going to be like, oh, I think you know, three questions is too short. Let's you know, add some more questions to the whole thing. Yes? An extra 30 minutes? Well, it kind of depends on what questions you're going to get. And I don't even know that because I haven't made up the questions for you guys yet. So I cannot determine how much time you're going to need if I don't even know what question I'm going to ask. I just know that there will be three questions. That's all. Yep. I still need to be, it has to be clear which one is which ones, and it doesn't take that much time to write down PC and ND, and PD and NC, so I would just kind of write that down. Oh, yeah. If the NC is blank to begin with, and you don't have a PD that is also blank after that, that's fine. All right. All right, so we're going to move on to the next question. You have a question? I will think about it, but that's all I can promise. It's still up to me to decide, but I'm taking your input into consideration. And no, that is not a chat GPT answer. <laughs> My student is asking me blah, 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 and blah, blah. How should I answer that question in a gentle and collegial way? I will take your input into consideration. Thank you for your input. I really appreciate it. Hmm? <laughs> but I will take it into consideration, you know, and I can also you know, kind of copy and paste you know, the questions into ChatGPT and ask, how much time do you think you know, people would need to answer these questions? And then ChatGPT would not be able to answer that question because you know, ChatGPT has no knowledge of tax toy processor, which is what the next question is all about. All right, so this is question number two, which has three parts. For 50%, what is the RTI description to describe the behavior of TTP according okay, <clears throat> to, okay, there we go, okay. According to the ROM.D bits on the rising edge. So it's a very specific thing, okay? These are the values of the various tunnels and whatnot. And I want to know what is the RTL description, you know, on the rising edge. You can use multiple expressions if there are multiple items updated. Use the following space to answer. Okay. First question What is RTL? Register transfer language. Very good. Which column in the opcode table is a demonstration of RTL? Column C. Very good. Okay, so we know what RTL is. It is just saying this thing becomes that. Okay, it is just like a C assignment expression. You say what is happening, you know, and then what gets updated. Now, certain types of operations do not update anything, or at least you know, we don't you know, kind of record that. Um, like a compare instruction does not update anything because it just goes through the motion of a subtraction, but it doesn't store the result of the subtraction anywhere. All right, so how do we get started with this one? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you an answer. I'll give you a first step, okay?
that is what you start with. Now, you can use mine, okay? But I would actually suggest you guys to print your own. Then you can you know, use color highlighting to highlight the thing however you want, okay? You can highlight all the registers because only the registers and RAM are the things that can either be updated or provide a value for other things to update. In other words, they are more important, much more important than the multiplexers, the, demo, the demultiplexers, and everything else. So I would suggest that you do your own printout and then highlight it and comment on it the way that you want to highlight it, okay? Otherwise, you can use the one that is provided in the exam, you know, but it's blank, okay? It doesn't have any highlighting, it doesn't have any commenting, so that's up to you to decide, but I'm telling you ahead of time that you can do better than just this. All right, so now we go back to the question, and then we try to analyze all of these things. All right, so we analyze this you know, line by line, okay? That means RAM is being selected, RAM is active, this means RAM is being read. Something else is using the D port probably to update something. RIMUX is a zero, but RIEN is a one, which means one of the four registers in the register bank is being updated. RI cell is a one, so that tells me register B is getting updated. So that tells me immediately, right away, I can write down the answer uh, I'm going to use the same sheet over here, you know, since you know, it's already here. I'm going to use you know, sheet two to answer question number two. So this is question number two, part one, and you know, part one of one you know, of question number two. So I know B is being updated. I just don't know how it is updated yet. I also know RAM is being you know, accessed, is being read. So I'm going to put asterisk something in here, which means... I'm dereferencing RAM, and it would, I would assume that something is using the value of a location in RAM so that it can be updated. Now, is it register B? I don't know yet, okay? I don't want to make that conclusion until I know for sure how everything is connected. But I can at least write down these things that I know for sure is happening. All right, um, register output zero EN is a zero, so that means your know, register output zero is not enabled. You know, nobody cares about register output zero of the register bank. Um, so that means you know, this select here is not useful at all. This DMUX is not useful at all because you know, nobody cares about your know, register output zero. Uh, register output one select is a three, which is you know, basically saying register D is connecting to register output one of the register bank. So now I throw that into the mix, okay? So I know register D is utilized. Oh, okay, I just did something stupid. Let's unstupid it. Okay, so I know register D is somewhere, okay, within this. In other words, as I go through the tunnels, I'm throwing things into a bin, okay? I'm looking at things and go like, okay, this is probably important, this is probably important, this is probably important. How are these things interconnected? I haven't figured out yet, okay? I'm just doing this as we go through the whole thing. Okay, so go back to you know, this thing here, continue with all the analysis. So this is probably important, okay? Because your know, register output one is probably enabled. So I want to find out you know, what R01D mux being a one is going to do. Believe me, if I, when I say this, I mean, you can choose whether to do it or not. I cannot remember, okay, what register output one D mux being a one is gonna do. So I'm gonna have to find it out the same way that you are going to have to find it out, which is looking at the circuit. So I go through the circuit. With your, your advantage is you don't have to scroll the way that I do because you know, I will give you the exam, your know, paper clip, so you can just you know, tear out all the pages. You know, this will be side by side with your answer. So I'm going to have to look at register output one D mux, which is this one here. It's supposed to be a one. So that means register output one over here connects to output one of this D multiplexer. So now I have to find out where does that go? So now you have to track it down. So we are looking at this thing here. 
it goes to this multiplexer. And now we have to look at FC, okay? So we have to look a little further of you know, what we are doing. So let's go back to the question, which I have to scroll all the way up. You don't have to do this in your exam. Um, ALUEN is a zero, so that means you know, the operation does not really matter because the ALU itself is disabled. Um, the address mux is a one. So that means you know, we have to look it up because you know, this thing is really important, okay? So we have to look it up. Address mux is a, is a one. So you, look, you go to the circuit again, and address mux is right here. It is a one, so that means we are using input one of this multiplexer to connect to the output, which is connecting to the A port of RAM. So now we track this one down, and it is the PC. In other words, the program counter is connected to the A port. So now I have one more piece of information that I can utilize and put in here because whatever is providing the address is the program counter. I know that for sure now. Is that okay? Does everybody follow the steps that I'm taking? Okay. So now, is register B getting the data I don't know yet, okay? Because I still have to look at the connectivity between all the things, but I have a strong suspicion that is the case. So we go back to the question. Oh, where's that? there you go. So we go back to the question, and then we say that PCEN is a one, so that's being updated. So now we have another thing that's being updated. The program counter itself is being updated as well. And the way the program counter is updated depends on a few things. PC mux mux is one of them. PC mux mux is a six in decimal or hexadecimal, and either way it's fine. So now we have to use that to also help us read the diagram, which is down here. All right. So PC mux mux is here. It is a six. So that means input six becomes the output of this multiplexer, which then becomes PC mux. This is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that means a zero connects to PC mux. PC mux is here as well. That means input zero is connected to the output. Input zero comes from the adder, the auto incrementing you know, mechanism. So that means the program counter is being incremented after this entire thing. So now I can go back to the spreadsheet and say, hmm, the program counter is getting auto-incremented, like that. Um, right, so we still have to analyze you know, where the output of RAM is going to. So now we go to the circuit again, and we look at the D port of RAM, which is the output now, because RAM is being read, and that's because load is a one. So now we track down this wire. It goes to quite a few places. And one of the wires they connect to is to this multiplexer here. We know RI mux is a, okay, I cannot remember, so I have to look it up again. So RI mux hopefully is a zero, because otherwise that means I made a mistake somewhere. Yep, it is a zero. So that means the output of RAM, the D part of RAM, connects to register input, or the, the input of the register bank, which means you know, I have just confirmed that the output of RAM is connected to, is being used to update register B. Register D end up not being used at all. So we can just get rid of that. And that is the conclusion. All right. So how are you going to study for something like this? Answer number one is you should have been studying all along. Do you remember I went through this exercise in class a few times, and I believe LDI was one of the instructions that I went through this entire process with? That's how you study. You basically have to go through the process, okay? You know, go to the execute phase of an instructions execution, look at all the tunnels, and figure out what is connected to what else, what is being updated in the execution phase of the instruction. 
and I already made that suggestion a few times, okay? So hopefully you have been doing that because that's how you study and prepare for questions like this. All right, so. You mean for this one? That is the same as the opcode table. We already talked about that when we explained LDI. It is the same as the C notation. So the asterisk means exactly the same thing as in C++. PC++ is a post-increment operator, exactly the same as in C++. So that means you know, the first thing we do is we take whatever the program counter has, let it point to a location in RAM and update register B with whatever content is at that location in RAM. The plus plus, because it's a post increment, it means it applies after the dereference and after the assignment operator is, read, is done. So after the whole thing, then we decide, okay, now it's time to update the program counter. And then you would expect us to write Yes because that's exactly how it is written in column C of the opcode table. Mm -hmm. Now, there are alternatives to write this too, okay? So if you say, oh, I don't like the concept of you know, a post increment operator, then you can go ahead and separate these into two steps and then say the program counter, you know, gets the program counter plus one after that. That would be also, you know, acceptable as an answer to this particular part. Is that okay? All right. All right, so getting back to the question, there's a part two. What is the mnemonic corresponding to this RTL description? Okay, can someone tell me the answer to that question? Because I just mentioned it. LDI. LDI. Yep, so it's LDIB with something. We don't know what the something is, okay? Because you know, all this tells me is whatever is the program counter pointing to is now put into register B, but we have no prior knowledge of what is the content at that location. So the best you can do is to put a question mark over here and go like, okay, we don't know what it is, but whatever it is, is being put into register B. All right, and three is what is the opcode corresponding to this RTL description? And I have no recollection of the opcode either. So I'm going to have to look it up. I have to look up the opcode table, which also means you know, that's something that you might want to bring with you is the opcode table. Um, so we go here. I look up the opcode table. Okay, well, it's all the way back here. All right, so we are looking up LDI. And LDI is right here. It is a six followed by a one, one, XX. XX is zero, one in this case, because we're dealing with register B. So it would, we would have one, one, zero, one over here, which is a D in hexadecimal. So six D is the hexadecimal of the opcode. But I have to be careful because I have to know whether the answer is supposed to be in hexadecimal. Yep, it is. So six D is the answer for this part. So I, let me go back to the question. So this way, you know, the entire question or the answer is logged. So now we specify Q213 is in hexadecimal 60. When you specify an answer to this question and you miss, you know, you do, if you, it's okay for you not to specify the 0x because the question specifically asked for a hexadecimal number to begin with, so I would understand if you do not specify 0x, I would understand it is hexadecimal already. All right, any questions about part one of question number two? Yes, go ahead. It's all based on the connectivity of the processor. Okay. So what I'm so in this particular version of the test, it is almost exactly the same thing as what I go went through when I explained LDI 
in the lecture the first time because we were given the values of the tunnels and we, address, we are trying to figure out what does that do, okay? But the other format of this kind of question is to reverse the whole thing. I give you the RTL and then you give me the values of the tunnels. So that's the other, that's one other way to ask questions in this particular you know, subject, yeah. the values of the tunnels. So you don't have to know the bit locations of each tunnel, you know, because that is, you know, I mean, it's hard to track. You know, I have problems tracking that. Are we good so far? All right, good. All right, so next one. Do you want me to skip to question number three because there are two more questions like this one in part three in question number two? Or do you want me to continue with this one and finish the other two? Yes. If you have a photographic memory. <laughs> well, I mean, I usually do the same thing every semester, reminding people what to bring with them. So if they forget, you know, it's kind of like people who forget to bring their pencil. It's like, it's a task, and you're forgetting your pencil. It's like, so just don't forget. Print it out, bring it with you every single day until the exam day. That's what I would have done. I mean, I'm forgetful too, in case you haven't noticed. I mean, seriously, I would do that, okay? Every day, you know, as you prepare for this exam and you have some additional sheets of paper, you go like, okay, I think this is important. Put it in your backpack and don't take it out, okay? Just leave it in the backpack until the exam is over. I would do that, okay? Be just because I'm forgetful as well. So you have to find strategies. If you're forgetful, if you have ADHD, you have to find strategies to, to kind of get around it. And that's what I do, you know? I just come up with strategies to help overcome, you know, those kinds of tendency of myself. All right. so. Um, let's move on to, okay, I cannot remember. Do, do we want to go through all three parts or do we want to move on to the third question? Yes. We got one question three and then come back. Okay, so uh, what about the class? You know, do you guys want to skip to question three and then come back? We got a few, a few thumbs up. Okay, all right, so let's go, let's do that. I think combined with the lab time, we have enough time to cover the entire thing. <clears throat> the nature of the other two parts are basically the same. You know, they just have different instructions, you know, that are being asked. Okay, so this is question number three, and I have to read the question. Believe it or not, I cannot remember how I asked these questions in the previous semester. You are reminded that the IEEE double precision floating point number interpretation of a 64-bit pattern X is as follows, blah, 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 okay? First question, do you know how to read that expression? Which part do you not know how to read? Now, there's a difference. There's a big difference between not knowing how to read it compared to it's complicated. It's going to take me a while to understand it. So which one is it? A while. Okay. This is nothing new. This is the Wikipedia page you know, equation, which I have already shown. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you want to know before the exam. Because I'm not going to change the IEEE double precision floating point number format. That's the whole point of question number three is do you know what it is? So this is one way to express it. It is no different from the way I explained it in the lecture that when we talk about the double precision floating point number, what each bit is representing. This is just summarizing the whole thing in one single equation. That's, it's the same thing, okay? So it's a reminder, just in case people say, you know, but I don't, rem I don't remember the IEEE double precision floating point number. I can just point to this, it's like, okay, the definition is in the question itself. 
because I don't want to tell people I cannot tell you what it is. So instead of doing that, I go like, yep, I gave you that. I gave you the definition. It's in the question itself. But you probably don't want to have to rely on this equation. You should have known what a double precision floating point number is and how to interpret what each bit is doing in the representation prior to the test. This is just for people who kind of forgot like little things. It's like, but I cannot remember how many bits we allocate to the exponent. You can look it up here. So, all right. So after running through the correct code to implement E10 to E2 for both assignments, we end up with the following structure. So this is after running through the entire thing. So this means, you know, you kind of have to remember what this thing is, okay? It is the structure, the sign bit is a one, the coefficient is this huge number here, the exponent of 10 is a zero, the exponent of two is negative 54. Instead of referring to a member, a member of the structure pointed to by PN, the following parts simply refers to the same, to the name of the member, therefore coif means you know, the coefficient of the structure that PN is pointing to and et cetera. In other words, I'm just saving myself a little bit of typing. So the value represented can be summarized as blah, 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 okay? So this is something that you should also know, you know, because you know, this is what we have done with the positive exponent and the negative exponent homework assignment. We have been trying to preserve the value being represented the entire time, and this is the value being represented. In other words, all the way up to here, there is nothing new. All right? I want to point that out because for people who are, going look, who are looking at this and go like, I have never seen this before, I'm formulating how to say this. You might need to go through the previous homework assignments and the previous lectures a little bit more carefully. Okay, that's you know, basically the bottom line. In other words, okay, as I said, there's nothing new up to this point. Okay, so number one says you rewrite coif as a binary number. You can use the notation of zero dot 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 zero to specify a sequence of zeros. In other words, if you have like 32 zeros, I don't want you to write 32 zeros for one simple reason. I cannot count. I don't want to count the number of zeros. So you just use this notation and then indicate the number of zeros represented in this fashion. Okay, so that's all I want you to do. Okay, so how do you answer this portion here? The coefficient is in hexadecimal A38 and then a whole bunch of zeros. How long do you think it should take you to answer this part of the question? Thirty seconds. Okay. What do you need to answer this question? Convert from hexadecimal to binary. So what do you need to do that? Yep, hex to binary table. Okay, we talked about that table already, so have it handy in the exam. Okay, so one more thing to jot down, one more thing that you want to remember to bring, unless you have it memorized already. You can also derive that during the test, which I do not recommend, but it, it's doable, okay? Because all we're doing is count from zero to nine, A to F. So on the other side, you have zero, 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 one, and keep counting up in binary until you count all the way up to one, 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 one. So you can recreate a table if you forget to bring the conversion table, but I would recommend you to bring that conversion table so that you don't have to do this on the fly in the exam and using up a little bit of time. Okay, so that's what I would recommend. What do you do after you have that conversion table? Every hexadecimal digit converts to four binary numbers. Okay, so very good. So if you have that table with you or if you have it memorized already, A is one zero one zero because it's basically ten. Three is zero zero one one. 
eight is one zero zero zero, and then the rest are all zeros. So that's when you say, okay, let me count the number of zeros here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So there are thirteen zeros in hexadecimal. So the way you are going to tell me <coughs> how many zeros there are is to use this notation and then specify using a little curly thing and specify how many zero or how many binary zeros there are within that bunch. So how many zeros are there? How many binary zeros are in 13 hexadecimal zeros? 13 times four, which is 52, very good. So all you have to do is to say zero dot 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 zero and then over on top of that, say there are 52 of these. That's all. So my explanation took more than 30 seconds, but the steps, you know, mechanically speaking, should be about a minute or so at the most. Yep. Yes. Um, I'll do my best <laughs> because you know, I'm using a, oh, I can do it on the whiteboard. So I cannot remember the answer already, so I have to go back to the question again. All right. So we have an A, which is a 1010, one, zero, and then we have a 3, which is a 0011, zero, zero, one, one, and then we have an 8, which is 1000, zero, 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 and then we have 0 dot 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 0 here, and then specify 52 like that. Something like that, okay? It doesn't have to be exactly like this. I just need to know this definite bit pattern and how many zeros are after that. That's all we need. Yep. All right. So that's one part, which is only 5% of the entire thing because this is really a very mechanical step. The next one is to normalize the coefficient so that it qualifies as a mantissa M in base two. Write the mantissa as a base two number. You, can, you may assume you can adjust the exponent of two, which is E2, to make up for the normalization. Okay, so what is a mantissa? How is a mantissa? How does it relate to a coefficient? Sorry? So the, yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, so basically a mantissa is a coefficient, but it also has to meet two requirements. One is it has to be greater than or equal to one, and in base two, it also has to be less than two, which also means you know, in, your, in your description, yeah, that is correct. It would be one point, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, it, but you, the only thing you can do to adjust everything else, so we are still representing the same value, is to change the exponent of two. So in this question, in this part, it's basically saying, you can rely on the ability to do that. I just need to know what the mantissa is going to look like. So the answer to that part, okay, so I have to write down the answer to the first part first, which is on the whiteboard, is 1010, 0011, and then a whole bunch of zeros here. So that's the first part. The second part is converting this into one point, zero, okay, I'm going to do it in the easiest way possible. Copy and paste, and put a point whoop, right here. Oh, okay, I did it to the wrong one. Okay, put a dot right here. There we go. In other words, this question, this part of the question is really asking, do you know what is a mantissa? How is a mantissa relating to a coefficient. That's all it's asking. Are we doing okay so far at this point? Okay, all right. So let's look at the third part. In the previous step to normalize the coefficient, 
to the base two mantissa M, I give it a certain name because we need to reference it again, E2 should be adjusted to E2A as opposed to just E2, so this is the new version of E2, so that the value being represented in this new form, instead of co-if, you know, I have M here because you know, we are using the mantissa here, but instead of E2, I have E2A because I need to make some adjustments so that you know, the value re remain the same. Okay, we're still representing the value, but we are making some adjustments to how the value is specified. Um, explain how you compute E to A. Okay, so how do we answer that question? The way you answer this question is understanding where the dot is, where the period is, when the coefficient is just the coefficient. Where is the implicit uh, decimal point? when we are just looking at the coefficient. The right. At the very right, very good. So we have the decimal point all the way here. When it becomes the mantissa, where is the decimal point? I'm gonna try to use a different color so that we can compare the two. So where, I cannot see another dry board marker, but that's okay. So where is the new decimal point, I mean, you can, we were looking at it earlier, yep. Okay, that's okay, I got it. So the new decimal point is here, when it becomes a mantissa. So the coefficient, because the mantissa is really still a coefficient, every time we shift the binary point or the decimal point to the left by one digit, how is the value changed? to the power of negative one, which is 0.5, right? It's halved. So every time we move the binary point by one place, the value of the coefficient is divided by two. How do we compensate for that division by two? By increasing the exponent of two by one. So that means the number of times we have to move this binary point is how we should increment E2 to become E2A. Does that make sense? Yes? Hopefully. So how many times do we move it? 63 times, very good. So that means E2A is E2 plus 63. And we already know what E2 is, so we can actually just go ahead and specify the answer, thank you. All right, so E2 was negative 54. So in this particular part of the question, then we say E2A is E2 plus 64, which is negative 54 plus 64, which is, our math sucks, this is 10, I think. There we go. And you probably want to give me an explanation why, oh, plus 63, I'm sorry. 63, not 64, because it depends on how many times we have moved the decimal point. It's 63 times, so that means you know, the answer is not 10 anymore. It is 9. There we go. Okay. And then you also have to remember to give me an explanation, you know, like something like every time we move the decimal point to the left by one binary digit, we have to increase the exponent of 2 by 1, so that we can compensate the division by two of the coefficient with a multiplication by two that is embedded into increasing the exponent of two by one. Something like that, okay? You know, whatever, however you want to use your words to explain that. All right, so that's one part. Now we are moving on to part four. What is V in base 10? A decimal number with a mixed fra fraction. Uh, as a decimal number with a mixed fraction, Show your steps to compute V. Okay. How would you give me the answer? You refer to the equations already given to you. Okay, so we look at the equation. 
the equation that is given to you is this one. We already know what is m, sorry, this one here. So we know what is m already. We also know what is E2A. So all you have to do is to go through that process and say, okay, so we have whatever m is, you know, times two to the power of nine in this case, and then you have to give me the answer as a mixed fraction. So I'm gonna do this. So we have 1.01, 0, 1.010, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, times two to the power of nine. So you look at this and go like, okay, uh, but I didn't bring my calculator, how do I do this? You move your decimal point, exactly. Because when we multiply the number by two, we are moving the binary point. I should say binary point because it's not a decimal number. So we move the binary point to the right every time we multiply you know, by two. So that means you know, we move it nine times. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then a nine. So that means there's a zero here and a dot over there. So that becomes one zero one zero 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 one one one. I'm just going to double check and count again. One two three. So there are nine digits right now, and we need one more, and then the point over here. So now you have to convert that into a decimal number. <clears throat> so if you forget to bring your calculator, how are we going to do this? Just add up the powers of two, right? You know. So we have a two plus four plus eight. We have no 16, no 32, no 64. We have one, a 128. We have no 256, but we also have a 512. And you know, now you have to add up all these things. So 128 plus 512 is 640. So we have 640 plus 14. 640 plus 14 is 654. There we go, I think. Is that okay? My mental math, math can be off. You know, I don't have a piece of paper to do the math on. But do you understand the process? This is already a mixed you know, fraction, you know, even though there's no quote unquote fraction part, but you know, a whole number is a special case of a mixed fraction. Hmm? Oh, it is negative, yep. You are correct. Yep. And there we go, thank you. All right, so, so we are now, now done with uh, number four, moving on to number five. Now we convert V to a double. We call this the resulting bit pattern X. What is the value of X63? Explain your answer. How long do you think this is gonna take you? As long as you say sign. S-I-G-N, so sign, the sign is what? It's a one because the value being represented is negative. Okay, so that's it, you know, for part number five, okay, you know, bit 63 is a one. Okay, moving on to the next one. What is the sub-bit pattern from 62 to 52? Okay, did we ever figure out that part? in the previous portion of this thing. In other words, I'm asking you about you know, what bit pattern should be specified from bit 52 to bit 62. There are 11 bits in it. So which part are we looking at in a, hmm? The exponent, the biased exponent. We already worked out the unbiased exponent. And what was the unbiased exponent? Okay, let's, let's go back to the 
answer that we have so far, what is the unbiased exponent? It's one of these things. Which one is it? Hmm? It is the nine, okay? The nine is the unbiased exponent. So that means we have to figure out what is the biased exponent and then convert it into phase two. So how do we figure out the biased exponent? What is the bias amount? 1,023, okay, very good. So we just have to say E is you know, the biased exponent and then biased exponent of two is the bias amount, which is 1,023 plus the whatever amount it's supposed to be, which is nine in this case. So that turns out to be, what is it? 1,032, okay which is 1,024 plus eight plus two. So I'm doing base two conversion, you know, because I want to re-express the thing as a sum of power of two. So when you express that, it becomes your know, one followed by uh, 10 zeros, because 1,024 is two to the power of 10. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And then, uh, okay, that doesn't work on a spreadsheet. We need a two, so that means that, that becomes a one. We also need an eight. This is also going to be a one. Hmm? I can't, sorry, I cannot hear you. Did I do the math wrong? Yep, I did. <laughs> so there's no two. You are correct. I cannot do my math. Okay, so there's no two, there's just the eight. So this is gone, which means this one should be a zero. There we go, thank you. Are we still doing okay? Some of your calculators can do base conversion, so you can actually make this really easy. Are we good so far? All right, so now we move on to the next one, uh, which is, okay, we just answered this part. You know, so now we are down to question number seven or part seven. What is the sub-bit pattern of you know, X51 to X0, meaning the rest of the 64 bits? Show your reasoning. The final answer of this part should be in base two. You can also use the zero dot 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 notation but also indicate how many zeros are in that particular notation. Okay, have we figured this part out yet? How do we call that part of a double? It has a, it has a name. We call it the blah, blah, blah of the mantissa. What is the blah, blah, blah? The fractional part, all right, very good. So do we know the entire mantissa based on the answers to the previous parts? Yes, this is the mantissa. Which part is the fractional part? Everything after the one dot, right? So that means this is the part that has to go here. But you have to make sure that you filled up all 52 bits, so you have to use that kind of notation. So this becomes zero, one, zero, 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 one, 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 and then the rest are all zeros. So now you can use the notation. I'm just gonna use I'm going to use this notation here, zero dot 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 zero, because I cannot use the kind of curly brace overhead thing. So I'm going to specify the number of zeros in curly braces. How many zeros do we need? How, what should I put at the blinky cursor here? We need how many bits again? We are looking at bit zero to bit 51. So how many bits are we looking at? 52, very good. And the non-zero portion or the portion to the bunch of zeros on the left-hand side, how many digits have we already specified? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have already specified eight of the 52 digits. So what is left? what is the leftover? 52 minus eight. So that would make it what? 44. Okay, so we got 44 zeros here. 
Now, this is just the notation that I use when I cannot use you know, that notation. You know, but since you are going to do it on a piece of paper, you can use this notation, and the 44 is going to be above the curly brace. Are we still doing okay so far? I hope so. Okay. Now what we need to do is to finish it up, okay? Two more parts and we are done. What is the entire bit pattern X? Express this answer in base two. Again, use the zero dot 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 notation to indicate a number of zeros, but make sure you indicate the actual number of zeros. Okay, I was being redundant here. Okay, all right, so how do we put the whole thing together? The whole thing is supposed to have 64 bits. The previous parts of this answer is already saying, x64 is supposed to be this, or 63, sorry, x63 is supposed to be this, x62 to x52 you know, is supposed to be this, x51 all the way down to x0 is supposed to be this. The question is, can you concatenate? I hope so. And do you know which way to put it together? Like where the sine bit is supposed to go, where the exponent is supposed to go, and where the fractional part of the mantissa is supposed to go? That should be a yes, right? Because you know every bit is numbered. It is already sequenced for you. So the answer to this question is we have a sine bit, then we have the nine digits for the biased exponent, which we have already figured out on row nine. So it's just a copy and paste kind of deal. So it's one followed by six zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then one and then three more zeros, one, two, three, and then followed by the fractional part of the mantissa, which is zero, one, zero, 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 one, 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 and then a whole bunch of zeros, the same number of zeros as last time because we haven't really changed anything here, right? So that would be the answer to the second to the last part. This is the entire 64-bit pattern. And then the last part is to convert this into hexadecimal. So how long do you think that's going to take you? Hmm, a minute? Well, maybe a minute if you need to sharpen your pencil and you only have a little pocket knife to do it. Okay, so this should be really quick, okay, because 1100, zero, zero. okay, so the, the way to do this is to rewrite this whole thing, but take out all the spaces first. So, you know, I know this is harder for you to do on a piece of paper, but then on the piece of paper, you can use some other ways to group digits into groups of four. So the idea is groups of four starting from the left-hand side, okay? That's the key. So since I cannot do the usual thing that I can do on paper, I'm going to have to do it using the, eh, the other way like so, okay, all right. So with this, I now have groups of four digits. So we have a C followed by a zero, followed by eight, followed by a four, followed by a seven, and then a bunch of zeros in hexadecimal this time. So can someone tell me how many zeros in hexadecimal we need to specify here? Yep, because we need to end up with 16 hexadecimal digits in order to make up 64 bits. Uh, C0847 is only accounting for five of the 16 digits, so that means the other 11 need to be zeros. There we go. So that's the entire thing. Do we have any questions about this one? Basically, question number three. Sorry? No, because you know, if I specify the question to be in hexadecimal, if you don't, you have a zero x, I would understand it is in hexadecimal. But you know, if you put zero x, I would not mark you wrong. I would just go like, yep, okay, very clear. Okay, so do we have any questions about number three? How do you prepare for question number three? I would say practice, you know, just kind of go through the whole process. 
and you know, go through the process that I used when I introduced this material the first time. I gave myself a specific number to convert it into double format. Okay, so you want to kind of do the same thing. The trick is you don't want to give yourself a number that is really hard to convert. So you want to specify a number that can already be specified in a small number of, as a sum of a small number of powers of two. Okay, for instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, 16 plus two plus a quarter plus an eighth. Okay, use that as an example. Um, or, you know, one, uh, a quarter, a sixteenth, followed by a sixty-fourth, okay? Something like that, okay? You want to have a relatively small number of powers of two as, you know, and then use that sum as a number that you convert into a double. In that lecture, I already gave you a way to verify your answer, so, you know, use that technique as well, okay? So that you can double check your answer and go like, Am I understanding, understanding this correctly? You know, how can I double check that my conversion process is correct? Because I already showed you how to do that in that lecture. So anything else? Anything else you need to understand about this question? Yes? <clears throat> Because we are maximizing the mantissa, not the mantissa, but the coefficient. Because um, in the conversion process, you know, um, most of the time you have to go through some division. And if you have to go through division, every division is going to lose something. And the way to minimize your, the loss of accuracy is to make the dividend as large as you can. Because we already know what the divisor has to be. The divisor is either base is either a 10 or a 2, right? So we know that you know, it's, a, it's a relatively small number. So the way you lose, the way you control the amount of precision that you have in the entire process is to maximize the, the um, dividend. And that's why we filled up all 64 bits for the coefficient before we performed the division. It's just a byproduct of the process that we go through to do the conversion. But it's good to finish the uh, conversion process, you know, either from um, a positive exponent or the negative exponent, so that it fills up all 64 bits. Because this way, the, the remaining logic to convert the number, to, to convert the representation into a double, is going to be the same. It doesn't matter where it came from but we go through the same process to convert it into an actual double in that case. So does that kind of answer the question? Okay. All right, so that's number three. Question number three, as it is asked in this particular case, is very, very mechanical. You just have to understand how a double represents the value. Um, and I said just. I did say just, because it really is just, okay? Because there are multiple ways you can find out, you know, how that is done. You can go to Wikipedia. I mean, some people like things in the picture and color and stuff like that, right? So you go to Wikipedia, you look up the double precision floating point number format. And that's also something that I showed in class. That's this, right? So you can look at this and look at, okay, what are these bits representing? And in Wikipedia, they gave you two formulae, okay? This one versus this one. The one that I gave you is equivalent to these. It's just you know, represented a little bit differently. So this is the kind of thing that you have to understand, hopefully, before the exam, because it is fixed already. I'm not gonna change how a double is representing its value, it is already fixed. So this is something that you can study and understand well before the exam. So by the time you take the exam, you already know all of this. The rest is fairly mechanical. So are we good with number three? OK. 
Okay. So now we can go back to number two and finish up the two parts of number two. So let's go back and look at this one. Okay. So once again, you know, the way I do this is going to be, is hopefully the same way that you're going to do it. Um, we go through all of this stuff here. Ram cell is a one. Okay, RAM is in use. RAM load is a one. We are reading from RAM. Okay, so we got those two already. Um, RIMUX is a one, but RIEN is a zero. So we are not updating any of the four registers in the register bank. Um, so that means, you know, RI cell, eh, irrelevant. RIMUX is also irrelevant. So if we are not using the RAM content to update one of the four registers in the register bank, you kind of have to ask the question, then what are we updating? Because we are reading from RAM, we are probably updating something because you're know, using the content of one location in RAM. So your next question, the next two questions is, um, what, ad, what is dictating the address of where we are reading from? And also what is using that location of RAM to update itself? So those are the two follow-up questions. So we continue to read all this. RI0EN is a zero, so that means register output zero of the register bank is not being used. So that means register output zero select is irrelevant. We don't need to know what it is. We don't care what it is. Same thing with RI register output zero DMUX. We also do not care what it is going to do. Um, ALUEN is a zero, so whatever it specifies as the op is not important because we are not using the ALU at all. Address mux is a one. Do you remember when address mux is a one, who is connected to the address port of RAM? Is it the PC? I cannot remember. Yes, I actually invented this processor, and yet I cannot remember anything about the processor. So I'm going to do what you need to do, which is to go to the diagram here and double check. I'm pretty sure you guys are correct because you study more than I do about my own processor, right? So uh, input one is this. This is also coming from PC. Very good. All right. So that is useful. And then we also have to know, but so far we haven't found anything that is being updated. We're reading from RAM. I'm expecting something to be updated. Ah, we do have that being updated. Then you guys go like, oh, but it's going to be incremented, right? We don't know. Right? Looking at just this part here, we do not know how the program counter is updated. What else do we need to read in order to find out how the program counter is updated? The one line before that, PC mux mux. Okay? This line here. It's a seven. What does that do? So, you look at the diagram. This is PC mux mux. It serves as the select of this multiplexer. So that means, you know, if PC mux mux is a seven, which is one, one, one in binary, we are selecting input seven to connect to the output. That's a one. It's a constant of one. So that means PC mux is a one. If PC mux is a one, I'm using the input, input one to connect to the output, which is then used to update the program counter. You follow this to another mux. This mux is using this, the output of this AND gate as the select. PC mux is one of the input. It is not negated. RI0, register output, RO0EN is the other input. It is a zero, but it is also negated. So now we have one and one as the input is to this AND gate. The output of the AND gate is going to be a one. So we track down input one of this multiplexer. That goes all the way to the, okay, let me follow again. Go here, goes here, goes here, goes here, goes here, goes here. Ah, that connects to the D port. So we are using the D port of RAM to update the program counter. Wait, I thought we used the program counter already to determine which location we are reading from RAM. Well, nothing says that we cannot do both at the same time. So in this case, the spreadsheet is right here. And I'm going to insert 
four rows here. For Q2, 2, 1. So in this case, the program counter is updated by whatever it is pointing to. Uh, which mnemonic are we dealing with here? JMPI, very good. So JMPI, and what is the opcode of JMPI? I can actually remember this one, but let's pretend that I cannot remember this. So I'm gonna have to look up the opcode table. Okay, so look up the opcode table. We're looking for JMPI. Okay, so JMPI is right here. This is the binary code. It is a four zero. So that means you know the answer to that part of the question is in hexadecimal four zero, and that's the entire thing. So this is Q222, Q223, and now we have to deal with part three of question number two. Insert four rows. There we go. Q231. Okay. All right, so we read the same thing again. RAM load is a one, okay, um, but RAM cell is a zero. So this time, RAM is not being used. Well, that saves a lot of trouble because now we don't have to track down what is address box and so on and so forth. But what is a one? R-I-E-N is a one. So that tells me that one of the four registers in the register bank is going to be updated. So other than just me talking about this now that you know that, oh, so when RIEN is a one, one of the four registers in the register bank is going to be updated, what other ways can you figure that part out? If I did not explain this at all, if I did not go over this entire test at all, how else can you figure out the answer? Yep, look at the register bank circuit, okay? It is also available to you. If you want to just look at that one and print it out, you can open um, regbank.circ by itself. Then you can go ahead and experiment with it. You play with its input pins and output pins and whatnot. I believe the test also includes that circuit. Yep, it's down here. And I actually explained that in class as well in one of the lectures. So you want to, um, if you cannot remember, okay, how to do that, you want to be able to locate that particular lecture and figure out you know, how the register bank itself work as a component of the processor. All right, so one of the registers is going to be updated, and I already know which register as well, because this is a two, so that means it is register C, very good. So now in the, in the answer sheet, I'm going to write down C equals to something, because I already know Register C is going to be updated. The only question is, how is it going to be updated? All right, so register output 0 EN is a 1. Aha, so that means the register output 0 of the register bank is significant in this case, which also means you know, I need to know which register is being presented as the output of register output 0. It's also a two, okay? So we know that register C is also utilized somewhere else to provide a value. All right, now, you know, since we know the register output zero is used, we kind of want to pay attention to the demultiplexer because we want to know, so where is it going? And I cannot remember what one means in this case. I have to look it up. So we look up the diagram. This is register output zero DMUX. If it is a one, then whatever this output is, is connected to here. Hmm. Then it goes to the ALU, but the ALU is, oh, it's probably in use this time. Okay, so let's double check. So we know register output zero is connected to in one of the ALU. It's providing a value to the ALU but we, I don't know which operation we are specifying, so we go back and double check that. So you can see that you know, ALUEN is a one, and the operation it's specifying is zero. So we are performing some kind of arithmetic operation 
do you remember what is component zero inside the ALU? The adder, very good, okay, because we have looked at the ALU quite a few times, okay, it's kind of hard to miss the first two. So we are adding, and register C is providing one of the values that we are adding. Okay, very good. So that means you know, in my answer sheet, I can now specify, uh, we are doing something like this, okay? But let's try to figure out what is adding. All right, so now we have to track down register output one, because one of the things that can connect to into is register output one. Register output one demux is a zero. So we kind of have to see what that is going to connect register output one to and it's a zero, so I'm gonna to go to the diagram. I really honestly cannot remember how the thing is set up, so I have to look it up. So this is register output one, dmux, and it is specifying a one or zero. Is it specifying zero or one? Okay, let, <laughs> I have to look up because I cannot remember. Uh, register output one, dmux is a zero. Okay, so it's a zero. All right, so if it is a zero, that means this input connects to output zero, which then connects to blah, blah, some la la land. Okay, so it does not connect to the ALU. But, so from the ALU's perspective, into is going through this multiplexer. This multiplexer has to select that is depending on FC FC is a tunnel that is determined here by this NAND gate. The NAND gate has two inputs. One is register output DMUX, which we already know is a zero. So we already know FC is going to be a one because this is a NAND gate. So FC is a one, then this multiplexer is gonna select input one, which is a constant of one. In other words, the constant of one is going through this multiplexer as a part of the input to the ALU. Okay, so I go back to my partial answer and go like, okay, we are calculating C plus one. I, I, I think some of you already know the rest of the story, but we're gonna have to confirm that, right? Okay, so what are we gonna do with the output of the ALU? Because if we're going through a calculation, chances are we probably want to store the result of the calculation somewhere. So we track down the out of the ALU, and it goes all the way here. So now we have to look up RI mux, which we already looked at. So if it is a one, that means you know, the, re register is, the register is updated based on the output of the ALU. So we want to check RI mux and see if it's a one. I believe it is, but I cannot remember. So we're gonna double check. RI mux is a one, woohoo, okay, very good. So that means this is the entire operation. Register C is incremented by one. Okay, Q232, what is the mnemonic corresponding to this RTL? Hmm? INC space C, very good. And then we have to look up the opcode. And I really cannot remember the opcode, so we're gonna look up the opcode table. Increment C. So increment is one of the last ones. It is a 1101XXXX. What is XX supposed to be this time? One zero, because we are specifying register C. So we are looking at 1101, which is a D and then 1010, which is an A, so the opcode is in hexadecimal, DC. D, oh, sorry, I take, I take it back, it's DA, DA. So it's DA, so let's go back to the answer part here. There we go. So it is supposed to be DA. This is Q233, there we go. So that's the entire thing. All right, so I know we are running out of time and you guys are running out of juice. 
I still have an exam to question to uh, make for tomorrow because I'm teaching 440 and I still have not made up the questions for that test. So I still have like a long night to go. It's going to be fun. But how many people looked at this and as a confirmation? You don't have to raise your hand, by the way. So if you look at this and this is a confirmation of your answer because you went through the whole test your prior to today, and you go like, okay, it's pretty much what I expected, you know, that's good. Okay, that means you have already understood the concepts, and because it's open book and open notes, that means you know if you think that I might forget about some of the details, you can just bring that with you. Um, if you look at this test and you go like, okay, many of these concepts seems to be new to me, then you have one week to study, okay, to basically make sure that you get all the concepts down to the point that you can reapply the concepts, not the steps that we went through today to answer the question of your exam next Tuesday, okay? So the, so, the, so the key is not to overdo all the steps that we went through today, but to understand what concepts we have used today to figure out the answer. Because your question is not gonna look like this. It might have some similarity to what you're seeing here, but it's not gonna be exactly like that. So that means you have to know the knowledge or the concepts, definitions, and et cetera, well enough to apply that to problem solve and you know, basically solve a new problem that you may not have seen before. We still have uh, Thursday, so if you are studying you, and you encounter something, you go like, I'm not really sure about this you know, or which way this is supposed to go. We can talk about it on Thursday. I still have office hours. Yes, go ahead. It is a week from today minus, okay, it's a week from, from today at um, 5.30 p.m. Because I don't want someone to show up exactly at this time next Tuesday and go like, but you said, you know, one week from today. You know, so that's why I show up at exactly 7.44 and ex expect the, the test to start now. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yep. On Thursday, we are gonna talk about compiling a program by hand. So you'll be given the C code, and your job is to turn it into TTP ASM code. So that's what we are covering. Or if you prefer, we can start on that today, and we still have technically another half hour to go. <laughs> you guys are going like, no, no, my brain is already filled to the brim, brim, to the brim and it's time to go home. Okay, all right, I'll see all of you on Thursday. I do have my office hours, so if you want to come to my office hour to ask questions, please do so. Let me stop the recorder first, and then we can...